ITC Limited, we are a 110 year old company and uh, that talks about sustainability. So it's a company which is into multi-businesses. We started with tobacco, but we are a multi-business conglomerate. We are into FMCG, hotels, uh, papers, IT and many other sectors. So uh, as a company, we have uh, we have taken a uh, what you say a stand or we have decided that we should uh, be balancing triple bottom line. Uh, this was almost two and a half decades back. Company took it as a policy and it was a board, uh, uh, what you say, commitment. Board has committed that ITC will be balancing triple bottom line. Now, of course, there are many things like ESG is the current terminology for the same thing, more or less, triple bottom line. So that way we have committed ourselves and there are many of you who actually are equally committed and we all do work in our areas. So coming to ITC, uh, this particular uh, thing is about ITC's water stewardship. Mainly what we do outside our uh, factory or outside our compound, the social development area, the community area or the catchment work, whatever we can call. Uh, and I am from the social investment team, which is uh, the CSR team because we have, that means our team is, uh, that's how we referred it as social investments. And the work we do is in conventional terms, the CSR work. So very quickly, the context since morning, this has been talked about, but again, means how it actually matters, not so much about numbers. So in India, agriculture is a major user. The reality is we should know. That doesn't mean agriculture is a culprit. Agriculture is a major user. That we should know. Huh? So because there are two stands taken, somebody will suddenly say agriculture, they should do this. We should uh, disincentivize or something or restrictions and all. At the same time, somebody will say it's livelihood, you corporates, you people coming and teaching and all. So it's not so. The fact is it's a major user. We should know that that much. And India is a global groundwater champion. Huh? The amount we extract I don't know how many of you have read, India's groundwater extraction has impacted Earth's spinning axis. India's uh, means it said groundwater extraction by globe, but specifically it is India's. That is what it is. And we know like majority of our like even today, Jaljeevan mission or anything we talk about. I was in lunchtime also having discussion with Aga Khan Foundation colleague. So, India's drinking water also, most of it comes from groundwater. And in agriculture also, majority of the area we refer as irrigated is actually getting irrigated by groundwater, not so much by surface water canals. So this is another thing. Again, black and white is, should we stop, no bores, all those things. But at the same time, reality is reality. We should also know that. And problems are all there. Climate change is impacting it or making the issues more severe. And this is Bangalore's photo, last year's photo. So one and a half year back in Bangalore, we used to discuss about uh, water bodies, all that in Bangalore peripheries. Now it is also about how water will go when rain comes. So that is a question. So things are changing. We all, and this is what, of course, Ms. Murudula and all have very clearly explained. I brought it in a simple terms. So the context is what, and it impacts me as ITC, my value chains and my, uh, uh, the what to say communities who are in my agri uh, value uh, catchments and in my factory neighborhood. So our watershed program quickly. So it's in two ways. One is as a company, I should be water positive. So that is about like whatever I am consuming inside compound, whatever recycling, rainwater harvesting we are doing, and outside also whatever we are doing in community area. That should be more than that. So it's a plain commitment. And apart from that, in community space, what we have aimed at is positive water balance. Means the supply and demand should be equal or at least supply should be more than demand. So positive water balance in the catchment so that there is water for all. Today and tomorrow means projected water balance also we work for. And specifically in agriculture, drought proofing agriculture. Drought proofing is about having more buffer means more buffer in groundwater form, more buffer in surface water bodies, and also being prepared through water use uh, efficient practices. So that if there is less rain, how can I actually, with that less rain also, how can the cultivation happen? So these are our broad objectives. And inside fence, we do all the water efficient practices possible. 
outside friends we work for uh, creating positive water balance by balancing supply and demand so supply is something we have actually started with but demand is a major thing we are now also working so in supply so the water is saved in three areas or three forms so one is water is saved in soil moisture so there are other words also like capillary water soil moisture there are some green water gray water blue water type terminologies also being used basically water is used uh, it's captured in soil moisture so we do biodiversity conservation we do catchment treatment watershed work so that the surface moisture improves the second is the surface water bodies like the tanks which we just now heard so all the surface water bodies these bodies store water that is second third is ground water so ground water is something very important we should all know one the dependence is very high the second thing its potential to store water is very higher than the above surface so ground water because we all have tapped fossil water means the water which is not last year's water it is something there since 100 year or sometimes 1000 years or so that water we have tapped so there is a good gap that is sitting there to fill we all can do lot there and at the same time due to climate change what we are all seeing is there is high intensity rainfall in a very small period so in 4 hours we will receive 10 cm that so how much our surface water bodies we do they can't absorb so ground water is one of the solution because there is a gap huge gap and also through percolation to certain extent we can also actually address the issue of the high intensity rainfall so ground water is the third so these are three areas we deal as part of supply and as part of demand we work for agri water use efficiency that uh, linked things are without compromising on farmer livelihoods and the practices which actually farmers will get means their live means their income their productivity will improve not some practice where their productivity or incomes are actually getting compromised only then farmer will adopt it is not like farmer will adopt because he or she is meant to save water so demand management uh, water use efficiency in agriculture and uh, if i see today the jal shakti ministry recently in one of the session uh, ajit uh, was also there in delhi so there was the jal shakti ministry's uh, secretary she also had mentioned the same things it was very uh, heartening to actually listen like ground water we should focus on ground water research and the demand management so these are very key things and we learned i am not saying we are from day one we knew all this but we learned and how we do is partnerships so while the csr money is not what we actually think is a game changer that csr's money or the resources or as a team we people our competencies are all meant to be anchoring coordinating and making things happen that's how we look at so it's about partnerships community partnerships implementing partnerships with credible ngos government partnerships for increasing scale and knowledge partnerships like how we are learning from iit at foundation similarly there are many knowledge partnerships we have and they are very good significant these data i don't want to burden now but there are many partnerships which are of good scale like in karnataka only example i am giving now is in karnataka we have with watershed development department to replicate drought proofing template in all their 157 world bank watersheds so we are working with them with government department we are not going to field we are training them and then we are hand, providing hand holding support so that they do water balance estimation and then they take up the required activities so this is how we actually implement our programs something what i talked till now so the key learnings is sub, uh, focus should be both on supply and demand and in supply more thrust on ground water and improving green cover not only the conventional water body revival i am not saying that is not required i am saying apart from that these two are also important and in demand more focus on agri some of the practices at least what we are doing across country are like direct seeding of rice zero tillage in wheat the sugarcane one which i will talk about seedling plantation and micro irrigation in many crops and the other thing we learnt is this watersheds what we deal in it we also last 10 15 years we were working at watershed level we are still working so watersheds what happen the neighboring watersheds impact immediately falls on your watershed how much our work you do a 5000 2000 3000 hectare type watershed 
you may say water balance all that and it water positive but the immediate one actually impacts this the ground water never stops there is no boundary and uh, uh, the what you see the surface flows also post monsoon surface uh, subsurface flows also get impacted by the neighboring watershed at a river basin you will have more uh, steadiness means basin is like an independent entity more or less uh, as per uh, uh, hydro geologists also like the uh, aquifers all those things they more or less flow as the river flows on the surface more or less i'm not saying totally so river basin level gives you more longevity of the positive water balance so we embarked upon river basins this is a learning for us we didn't start with this and uh, now we are actually looking at replicate this template of supply and demand how do we actually take to urban areas like bangalore is an area where we are trying or struggling whatever we can say but i am not saying that we are experts in that area other things we have quite some journey in the rural sector the five basins we work in many basins but five where we have a dedicated program so the god is one i will talk about there is a kolans in madhya pradesh bhavani in uh, tamil nadu and mureru in uh, uh, telangana and the fifth is south pennar which actually bangalore city uh, is part of it so we, this we have work is going on but the study we started with iisc bangalore recently here i should give example just one and a half year before we discussed with iisc to get a study done water balance all that today two things have changed one is this flood which has come in bangalore so it is not so much about positive water balance the risks are what to do when there is a flood the second thing is bangalore as a city the numbers that were told to me is like a 1400 mld or something is the water that is released through the sewage water already something close to 800 or like that they have stps two stps and they are going to add one more and release it back to agriculture so there is no water stress being felt in this basin at least the immediate area of bangalore that's how situation changed so now there are new dynamics we will understand what comes out of it so river basin these are the ones we are working and then i come to the god river which is the topic we are discussing today so god is in maharashtra god joins bima bima joins krishna that is how it is god basin around 10 lakh acres uh, it flows through pune and ahmednagar districts why we started god so for everything there is a reason we have two factories in ranjangao midc the industrial area of uh, pune and uh, the whole industrial area gets water from chinchini dam which is fed by god river so if we see the whole dam's water the midc allotment is some 2 to 3 percent but simple when we have done source sustenance means where is it is water coming who are my co dependents who all are co dependents means if i take more water they will suffer they take more water i will suffer whatever so then the co dependent is whole god basin when we have delineated so this was our first basin uh, then the other ones followed so then uh, it was also where we learned and we have done some significant work so this basin when we got a study done this study was uh, done by two agencies aquadam and uh, ci uh, ci is a uh, has a cell special project cell it was pune based now it is not there i think both of them have together done a one year study for us so what they found the basin is water positive if you look at the whole annual estimate it is water positive there is some 120 million cubic meter water positive status but if you just separate post monsoon after rainfall that season when the agriculture demand is high it is actually negative means in rainy season water flows away whatever water then you actually say so why is this gap getting uh, filled by extracting ground water or by compromising needs either of them so this is a learning and many basins are actually round the year negative also but in god case this is what has come up so if you see the water demand sugarcane and onion two crops mainly sugarcane actually is almost taking 60% and rest of agri and non agri that is where the whole water demand is coming from so this was a challenge that was there to us and the study suggested three main things like reducing demand in post monsoon season from agri and improving forest cover because in the upper ridges these are all western ghats there are uh, forest there is almost uh, 70000 acres of uh, they call it god uh, uh, range the forest uh, language so there is uh, that forest cover is there 
that forest cover and the biomass in the catchment when it is dwindling the dams which are in the upstream are actually getting silted so one is working in dam you can but more important is as a systemic solution improve the green cover in forest and in the outside forest fringe area so that the silt coming into the dams comes down over a period of time and third is groundwater recharge three things so this gets repeated it will get repeated again once more is the implementation approach trust on partnerships so it is not itc's money which will actually solve problem it is about how we actually anchor the whole thing that will that can solve the problem that's what we looked at and uh, in river basin see we should work on verticals because this is a large area means if it is a 5000 hectare we will take up 100 water bodies work all that but in river basins there are three major problems that are identified so there are three verticals so these three we have taken up independently means on each of them there was a plan and we started working so to make it happen then we were partnered with water resource department forest department uh, our first forest partnership actually for itc also and maharashtra state rural livelihood mission for women groups to take up many agricultural equipment hiring all that and knowledge partnership with vasanda sugar institute and kvk and uh, cgir for climate smart villages and uh, our ngos three of them there are many of them in other themes but in water they were by uh, dsc and afam afam is a local uh, organization dsc is from uh, amdavad and by is uh, in pune but it's a pan india organization many of you will be knowing and other stakeholder engagements like water resource group of world bank one of the stakeholder who actually facilitated the partnership with the government of uh, the water resource department sugar mills see the custodians who are the custodians government sugar mill the farmer they are the custodians it's not itc who will be the custodian or tomorrow who will take care of the entire thing so sugar mills were very important <coughs> stakeholder and service providers service providers like a drip irrigation equipment provi uh, providing ones banks for loans these were all the service providers so we worked with all of them many of them were formal partnerships with government all these are formal partnership so the work which i just mentioned in photographs so the catchment treatment for conserving water biodiversity to conserve water groundwater recharge in fracture zones to recharge water faster water will anyhow get recharged when it is in a tank or whatever it is but it is about making it faster and demand so surface water bodies is there i am not showing it because it's what we all know very well so demand management so sugarcane and onion two crops i will talk about the specific practices in coming slides so <clears throat> what it has led after 5 years we worked for 5 years from 2016 till uh, 21 after getting the study in our hands so the whole demand management the water saving here it is a very big number i am bringing but i will definitely share the process behind it in next slides so sugarcane saving was 148 million cubic meters around 40000 acres or so uh, brought under the practices which were recommended by vasundha the sugar institute we worked with institute we worked with farmers sugar mills everyone to make make it happen 3 million from onion and uh, this one from water bodies and recharge 1 million it is to be noted if we actually look at money per se this 1 million costed us more than this two. because it's water body physical work so this is not like it is only 1 million against 148 actual money per se this is the one which has costed more so totally there is some 152 million cubic meter last year we added the program is still going on 152 as against the gap of 62 million cubic meter this is how the water balance when we revisited last year after 5 years the whole balance done this is where we stand and important thing is this saving demand management actually it is saved in the post monsoon means from october till summer month means may, uh, june month this is the period when water lifting happened there we saved through the water efficient practices there was a question to us actually many people say all this is good but how do i know visually and we also didn't have an answer so luckily that's why joe helped us so there are three slides he has recently done a study for us uh, his he and his team so he will share that because they are really technical and he can explain it better so uh, so point is uh, okay these are visual uh, proofs because this water budgeting means people can say na i can still enter 170 cubic meters 
here means of course vasandada sugar institute had done a third party study they gave a impact assessment it's in public domain but still there is visual thing which was very interesting we found so we just visualize this is where the work happened that's the upstream work this is downstream of the work itself and then we looked at a control area which is this other basin and this is the downstream of the control and this is overall connected if you just look at the flow so this is just a structure we built to how do you measure impact in a river structure river basin structure so you've seen some of the other slides also which is water bodies etc but this was a little bit more challenging so here's how we kind of looked at it is the first thing we looked at is the overall reservoir capture so the water that flows anywhere will be captured in reservoirs and we broke it up into these parts and this is what interestingly came out we compared two periods 2019-22 as a four year period versus 15 to 18 the early stage of the project like the images are uh, these images are a single year image but the data is from four years so this is what we found is the project downstream itself grew by 15% which was the largest the upstream grew by 13 the overall downstream grew by 9 so these were the numbers and if you look at the control area the control area only grew by 7 so there's a clear difference in the overall water capture in the overall system both in the control area and downstream area and the overall so that was one of the kind of key dimensions how did we visualize this right how do we visualize this so this is just to give you a sense of what this looks like the inner blue that you see there is the water in the early period of course this is just a 15 picture the outer blue is the overlay of the water in the latter period the dark blue and the red is still dry right so this is the image of the control upstream so you can see most of it still shows as inner blue there's a few areas where you are seeing a little bit of extension in the latter period which is the increase that we talked about right and then there's there is still red in the overall system itself that you're seeing that's already there right but that difference is that what i call that 7% is the dark blue that's emerged in terms of the increase capture if you look at what happened in the upstream of the project you can see large parts of this dark blue which is the increase that's happened in the latter years in the reservoir itself this is what's happening in the overall downstream which is a much bigger dam and you can see a large part of that in increased capacity on the edges of the dam itself and still some reds are there that still remain and then of course that's the project area itself so the project area itself just downstream of the project area you're seeing a large extension so that's how we've looked at how you can actually truly measure this from a scientific then we say let's go a step further because you're looking at river flows changing can we really understand have river flows change and so what we said is we look at the the ratio of river flows so we said if 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 the upstream has gone up the downstream should also commence to take over so let's look at a ratio what's the ratio of the downstream to the upstream in these years and has that percentage gone up and there too we found a very remarkable result and this is all post monsoon numbers so the project downstream over the upstream had a 33% increase right so the ratio was something it has gone up by 33% the overall downstream of the upstream had an 8% increase right and the control upstream over the downstream had a 2% increase so this takes into account that different years you have different flows but the rate of flow increases gives you a sense as have you really increased the amount of the upstream water that you are releasing So this is another technical analysis we were able to add to again showcase. So again, a big part of what you will see is a large number of us do programs, but confidence comes when you can measure. And so measuring things has been a big part of what we try to add value with many of our partners. But now I will go back to Vijay because the real truth is in the actual. How did this happen? And he will talk tell us about all of that. So just. Uh... how many of you agree with me that it was too technical <laughs> so you can definitely discuss with joe because he explained me thrice i was happy definitely but i couldn't dare to actually explain that so i requested him to do that but uh, one thing is joe i uh, i should uh, acknowledge this from itc's behalf i can't take names but we went to many people to get this because the simple question is how do i know our government partner asked us it's all good but how do i know because uh, i am going to jal shakti ministry and i am going to present this so then your this one is really going to help uh, and because they are also partners it's not like they questioned us they also want to actually see this visually so this was a great thing you suggested to us and you had made uh, you could make it happen 
So that way we are very happy. And we need to learn from you more and understand the numbers also. Apart from percentages, the absolute numbers behind that. So we talked about how ITC is looking at water, uh, our footprint and for community. Then the gourd as one of the things, which was our first river basin. We are going to work in many such basins now. And uh, what could we do in gourd? Through partnerships, through community engagement and through this different approach, like in localized watershed areas, we actually, we also like how Asian paints work. We also get into water bodies, all those I mean, demand management also in that area. But in river basin, these are verticals. We pick up the major one or two challenges and then work on that because otherwise it's also about time and resources. So that is the major difference in basins. We at least think like suppose tomorrow we get into Ganga basin, maybe you take paddy uh, and wheat entire Ganga basin. So that will solve uh, address your 40 to 50 percent of water. Maybe I'm just saying because that's what members say initially when we look at Ganga basin. Then the third one again is sugarcane in Ganga basin. So in Ganga Basin also this issue is coming up and there are many papers already, IWMA and all have written, post monsoon of Ganga is also under stress, water stress. And uh, uh, actually many of the UP and even not Ganga, but the Western state like Punjab and all, they are the highest water stressed in terms of groundwater because the depletion is happening more as compared to South. So West and more than West, the North and the Northwest states are actually taking more water. So that way the river basin has taught us what are the issues we should focus upon and we definitely have got uh, what to say a success and a template both from our goat basin and specifically coming to what did we do in sugarcane because that big number just looks like a magic or like a wonder type thing but there is a process we def definitely have worked on that so one is uh, we worked with uh, locally there is an institute Vasandada sugar institute recognized by ICR, it is actually Sugar Mills Federation had uh, uh, formed this and the many sugar mill, whatever the big uh, leaders or whoever they are also in the board of this institute was on the other sugar institute. So we approached many institutes, including them also. So what are the solutions that are there to uh, actually address the water, uh, to save water in sugar cane? And there are many means, uh, Again, there is something I want to add here. We focused on agronomical solutions, not on drip or micro irrigation so much. That is definitely going to be there that saves more water. But problem is the adoption, the scale, because there is an investment, there's government subsidy, many linkages are there. So agronomical practices, when farmer picks up, the farmer is convinced he or she actually can adopt it. So agronomical practice is what we focused more, apart from the conventional drip, which is also required, so they actually had suggested a practice, one of the one which made, was the game changer for us. And then we partnered with them. That one is they will train us, our partner uh, teams and uh, the farmers, the farmer leaders and all regularly. So we had like every batch we used to have like 40 each and we completed 400 in first year look, like that in every five years, the farmer opinion leaders uh, got, getting trained. And also we got the sugar mill field staff trained by them. Because they are, as I said, they are the custodians. They are the people who have clout with the farmers more uh, going forward. So sugar mill field workers also got trained. And uh, parallelly, there were these interns and the uh, professor uh, specifically put up to do the data collection so that the impact is also evaluated. So these are the tasks which Vasandata Sugar Institute had done for us. So the technical solution, there are three key practices. The first one is what I meant, the agronomical practice, which is in a way major game changer because the adoption is higher in this. So I don't know how many of you know, like sugarcane, the sugarcane, it's like a stick, na, the grass. It is a grass family, but it's a stick. So it is cut and they call it set, S-E-T-T, set plantation. So there is a like one and after two feet set, which is planted, um, is kept in the soil, in the furrows, uh, these furrows and plantation is done. So in that, what happens? Farmer uses lot of plant, I mean the material is high because they are, otherwise that could have been sold as a sugar cane to mills. So there is a lot of material consumption. And when they plant it from day one, it is in the main field, irrigation starts. So instead of that, there's something which was already sitting. It's not like ITC found it. Institute had it. Only thing they could not succeed in replication. That was very clear. They could not take it to larger scale. Is nursery. 
So instead of the set plantation, the node which is there, the node is taken either through extraction, it, it is called as a, a bud extractor or simple thing, which again is a learning for us uh, because we need to simplify, otherwise it will fail. Things are there to fail, any new thing. People will have 100 questions. My own partners, my own team will have questions. This doesn't work out. Farmer said so, or so on, so So we also realized, so the simplification is, we said, why that bud has to be extracted? Just uh, near the node, cut it, this side and that side. So that is this much side. So the balanced sugar cane is still being sold. So farmers, that uh, material recovery has gone up. In industrial terms, it is material recovery. Otherwise, that whole thing goes as a seed material. So there is a cost saving there. And this is uh, raised in nursery for 45 days. So with this, what happens? Up to three irrigations are saved in main fit. In nursery, it is a simple sprinkling or that type of irrigation. But if it was in the main field, so there are three more irrigations. So out of 14 to 15 irrigations in the whole life cycle of sugar cane, we have saved three. That is a simple calculation that was happened. And as I said, it was already there as a technology. So what we could do is, first we attempted that we will do through women groups. So with women groups, we did do, but it was not scaling up. They are still doing. Actually, they were the people who got initially started that nursery raising as a business. So the margins are very thin. They don't make much money. So in the village, it's okay, but it can't be a very large, like every village will have two, three women groups doing and all. Then the next thing we got is then farmer's own nursery. That's when this bud extractor thing came up. Everyone having a bud extractor, taking the bud, all those were big issues. So then this was, this solution came up, like just simply cut, take the node and raise the nursery. So this clicked, when farmers have raised their own nursery, it clicked. And it also tells us if a farmer is raising nursery, that means farmer is going to plant. Otherwise, if woman is raising nursery, woman grew and going to sell, you have to work like uh, creating demand, convincing farmer, you purchase from them, all those things. But now farmer is raising nursery and that's how it got internalized in five years. That is the main thing. Otherwise, tomorrow if we withdraw program, it will may or may not happen. But today it's a simple thing. Like how they raise for paddy or chili or some other crop, they are also raising nursery and then they are planting. So this is the one which is something I will feel proud about. The other practices, of course, there are two more practices, drip irrigation. So those nursery seedlings, when they are planted, the recommendation was also wider spacing compared to the normal plantation which farmers do and only have one drip line. For two lines, it will be one drip line. Otherwise, for every line, we will have a drip. So in the middle, it will be a drip line. So it saves cost of the drip system establishment and wider spacing. Many of you know, like these are called as intensification, like uh, so system of rice intensification. Intensification means actually you have less plants. It's not more plants. You have a wider spacing. So it takes time. Roots get established. More tillers will come. Yield will be higher. That is the thing. So here, wider spacing has also made it happen that the yield goes up. So against an average of 70 to 80 tons per uh, acre, so it is a, in an average of 100 to 110 uh, tons. It is also in the Vasandada report also. That is because of this wider spacing, which allows farmers to actually, the crop actually to grow better and have more tillers. The third is trash mulching. Uh, we all know Delhi, we all know Punjab, farmers and all, but we don't know that sugarcane also gets burnt. The many crops which gets burnt after the harvest. So this has to be actually mulched back instead of burning. You mulch, so it adds organic matter to soil and it also improves the moisture retention. It is also a water saving tool apart from improving the soil fertility. So here what we have done is, mulchers are very big equipments. And today we can't expect like earlier days, farmers will do localized small solutions. They are also like us, they are very busy. They don't want to get into those hard work, which is not otherwise possible. So mulchers, sugar mills, have, we convinced them to purchase. And they gave it on rent to the farmers because they are around one to two crore cost. That is the thing. So the mulchers are coming, uh, means farmer puts an indent, mulcher comes and the mulching is done. So if you see this here, this is the mulch field. Otherwise, it will be simple soil and the moisture gets lost. So these three practices, but I will, as I said, the first practice is what we will take pride in and which is the one which actually could do the major change. And there are partners 
which I mentioned NGOs, uh, KVK and uh, Vasandha Sugar Institute and CGI. Because we next thing we are working on is climate smart villages. I mean, so all crops of the village, we are working for reducing the, means assessing the climate risk and preparing farmers to meet the climate risk. So this is another program, but we have layered it upon in gold also, but we do it across country so that our farmers are actually climate resilient and have less losses as compared to others. So there are a few videos from stakeholders. Hmm. This is the Vasandhara Sugar Institute professor. Seedling practices, seedling it practices. was promoted was and promoted. as compared to the set planting, the seedling planting was beneficial to the farmers. Two to three irrigations, they were saved and around 20% water saving was possible when we use the uh, seedling plantation. There is a substantial reduction in the cost of cultivation of the sugarcane. The farmers were also given the training at VSI through their uh, ITC's partner NGOs like APAM, DSC, BIAP and the farmers they were uh, given training in the form of lectures as well as some practicals. Sugar mills were also taken into consideration because all the farmers they are the members of the cooperative sugar mills and they were also uh, involved in the training and uh, demonstration process. So the numbers, I don't think we should get much into it. The numbers are there. The presentations will be shared later. So just as a comparison, so what is the per acre uh, water saving? Uh, the, uh, the practice which we promote takes almost half of the conventional practice. And what is the improvement in yield, which I had mentioned? And uh, the water consumption per quintal means if we actually divide yield by the actual water which is being consumed, so it is even better because the what we say per crop more drop. So that way also it is even better because yield also improved and water has reduced. So these are the numbers which actually then translated into the almost that uh, the number of acres we have covered around 44,000 I think last count the sugar cane. Similar thing was also done with onion but a small saving but sugar cane major saving. So we multiply that per acre saving into the number of acres. So that is the potential water saving we could actually get. And there are two more, one from our partner BIAF and one from the water resource department, the government partner who is working with us. If we think about the other watershed programs, the programs are more focused on supply side but it was very important here to address the issues of demand side also therefore uh, this project is different and uh, it has uh, more focus on water balance and sustaining the water resources for long term sustainability ya karyakramamule amcha chare hi pani vapar sanstha madhe khup badal jale purvi ya sanstha active nahutya पानी घेने पानी पट्टी देने एवडे पुरते संस्थे से काम होते पन आईटीसी ने दिलेले प्रशिक्षण नंतर या संस्थान मध्ये अमूलाग्र बदल जाले पानी वापर संस्थान ने पाण्याचा ताळेबंद तयार केला पानी वॉल्युमेट्रिक पद्धतीने मोजून घेण्यास सुरुवात केली वापर संस्थेच्या अखत्यारीत असलेल्या चारी व देखभाल दुरुस्ती केले केली ज्यामुळे पाण्याचा अपव्यय कमी होऊ खालच्या भागात पाणी लवकर पोहोचण्यास मदत झाली त्यामुळे सर्व शेतकऱ्यांना पाणी मिळण्यास सुरुवात झाली पाण्याचा ताळेबंद केल्यामुळे पाण्याची उपलब्धता व गरज यांची माहिती मिळाली त्यामुळे जर आता सप्लाय कमी असेल तर उपलब्ध पाण्याचा कार्यक्षम पद्धतीने वापर करण्यात येतो व सप्लाय जास्त असेल तर पाण्याची बचत करून उपलब्ध पाणी पुढील हंगामात वापरण्यात येते so, Again, numbers on the income, so I won't get into that, as I said, this can be shared. So, no one will adopt if there is a compromise in yields or incomes. That is very simple. So, as we are as corporates, so the same thing applies to farmers. And I want to add, there are different views, but I want to clearly say we will never, we took a call that we will never ask farmer to change a crop. The major thing many people asked me, maybe after this I may get question also, that 
uh, why is farmer cultivating sugarcane? You should have asked farmer to change the crop because it's as business oriented, as livelihood oriented as it is to us, our business. Same thing is for farmers. But the problem is there. Then what can we do for the problem? That's what we as a because we all know like uh, there is a lot of infrastructure that has gone into it. And today it can be simple that a farmer change from sugarcane and goes to maize. They are not there to do uh, subsistence farming. They also are aspirational. They also want to actually improve in their whatever like, uh, living conditions. Uh, one example means I will just say uh, uh, there was uh, Mr. R S Pannu, I think, or K S Pannu, the Pollution Control Board head of Punjab. In one forum, the like, people were asking like Punjab uh, the paddy burning. So why uh, and also the groundwater stress. So you should have shifted it. Why don't you advise that farmers to change from paddy crop? So he gave so many numbers. He said, India made us cultivate paddy so that we feed you. That is the point, which is a fact. Yeah? We feed you and you people are now blaming us and you people made us invest a state government money also, apart from central, so many rice mills, so many warehouses, go-downs, agri market company, all that. And today, very simply, you are saying you are burning. So please change. It's not so. We have done this for India not only for us. So then find an alternative. These should be systemic solutions. And ITC, we are clear, we are not even there for systemic solution. We are a corporate. We are not there to have a long-term strategy to make farmers shift from this crop to that crop. So that's how, that is one more thing I wanted to share. Opinions can differ. That we don't recommend on change of crops. So the last, there are two more testimonies, mainly the community thing. One is from a farmer who has adopted and another is a woman group, I think, who had... Uh, some role in agri equipment business means hiring the agri equipment. Robotic mulo, amsa sadi din char azarasas nista phakta kharsa vaslanu sun. Amche total daha azara parin bachit zali. Tya mulo robotic mulo lawle mulo drip kele mulo amche sadaranta. जे सुरुवातीच 60 70 टनांचं एव्हरेज होतं ते आम्ही साधारणतः 100 ते 113 टनापर्यंत आम्ही गेलो त्यामुळे साजिक आमचं उत्पन्न वाढलं आमचा खर्चही कमी झाला त्यामुळे साधारणतः कमीत कमी आमचं एकरी उत्पन्न 40 ते 3 लाख पर्यंत वाढलं माझ्या पद्धतीच्या गटाच्या माध्यमातून आम्ही गावामध्ये फिरलो गाव आणि परिसर यामध्ये कोणती कोणती अवजारे चालतात याचा आम्ही अभ्यास केला व त्यानुसार मल्चर रोटावेटर नांगर सायकल कोळपे स्प्रिंकलर सेट ही अवजारे बचत गटातील बचत गटाच्या माध्यमातून शेतकऱ्यांना भाडे तत्वावर देण्यास सुरुवात केली बचत गटातील जवळपास ऐंशी टक्के महिला भूमिहीन होत्या परंतु ते आता स्वतःचा व्यवसाय करत आहेत अवजार बँकमुळे आम्हाला जवळपास पंच्याऐंशी हजार रुपये नफा झाला या नफ्यातून आम्ही गांडूळ खत प्रकल्प व रोप वाटिका आणखी नवीन व्यवसाय चालू केले so uh, the last slide this is more about uh, what is the spread of sugar cane because the technology solution definitely can be adopted and we ourselves are working in uttarakhand and uttar pradesh also same solution we are already doing there here also very small uh, in uh, mysore bordering with mandya we are also doing that so there is a huge scope and universe so the point is we can save water and still improve farmer livelihoods and also uh, what you say, address the water stress situation of all of us, India's water stress situation by working in demand management and by working in a basin approach or at a large scale uh, spread out area approach. That is what I had to share. Thank you. So Amit, you played a, you know, besides your corporate role, like we found out and we're very excited about the fact that you're also sugarcane farmer, right? And I'm sure you would have some thoughts based on what you're hearing and what's possible. So I think those perspectives would be very fascinating to hear. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I must reintroduce myself. I'm a farmer first. Corporate affairs, uh, corporate role is also there. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. And uh, I must thank Vijay. So uh, I think uh, very, very enlightening, especially the sap to sapling bit we are still on sap you must come to indo ganges plains please and uh, if not i'll come to you <laughs> for sure so it was uh, very heartening to see how agronomic practices uh, can and nothing speaks uh, 
more than when one sees the result from 521 quintals uh, tons per acre to 621 tons per acre. Mm -hmm. 621 quintals. Huh? Uh, this is quintals, quintals yeah, yeah. 113. Yeah. So that was uh, uh, really fascinating that way. Uh, nothing speaks about that. So agriculture, as we know in India, is more of, of a, uh, it's not even an economic activity. The moment you turn it into an economic activity by these things, I think then that's where the awareness builds in. That's where the motivation comes in. So uh, I think uh, uh, one question which I had, and maybe that could lead to one more benefit are coming out of it. When do you uh, plant the saplings? The same season means 45 days after. And when, the... at which part of the year? It is uh, generally there are two to three seasons in the yeah. sugarcane. Uh, recommended one happens in June, uh, mm -hmm. July month, then another is September. So, uh, so that's an addition uh, element here, maybe an extra crop, multi-cropping can also be a beneficial uh, outcome of this. Actually, there is an intercrop, marigold yeah. or vegetable, yeah. which has been introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say all the farmers who are doing seedling have adopted that, but 40, 50 percent, because farmers don't want to do extra work, even if there is extra money. Sugarcane means once you plant it, it's only irrigation. But a small farmer is doing that, yeah. the additional crop. Yeah, so that's what uh, immediately was what came to my mind as a farmer again was uh, that there could be an extra crop per year that could come uh, because of this uh, uh, sapling thing. And definitely it leads to a lot of saving of uh, the cane, which can go to the factory and more yielding, uh, more uh, uh, benefits could come to the farmer for sure. More intriguing was also the water aspect uh, because two or three uh, flood irrigation or maybe even the um, uh, micro irrigation technique through, through micro irrigation, it can be saved. So, sugarcane, if you are doing flood irrigation, if the sapling uh, is being planted, the entire field need not to be flooded, only the nursery need to be flooded. So, that's where I think this is a very good agronomic practice, and it just requires awareness and it trickles down. If there's one farmer who adopts this in a village, I am sure when the, once the benefits are seen, uh, the, uh, the crowd would follow. Uh, so I think what is needed is to ex exemplify in uh, pockets uh, as pilots. And on the water front also, I think there was significant saving, 50%. Uh, I think this is significant uh, if we look at the post-monsoon uh, aspect, whether you are uh, uh, water rich and more, as, and I think it came out during the presentation also. We are depleting our scarce resource water resources. So, if these uh, practices are uh, taken, I think, uh, and imbibed, uh, and it's basically we are sitting in a room, how many of us are actually farming here? So, uh, that's where the real uh, challenge lies is how do we uh, spread this awareness to the real. Uh, person who is on the ground who would adopt this. So I think the uh, proof of the pudding lies in eating it. One is the economic benefit that is coming out of it, which is uh, yield per acre, water conservation, and other agronomic practices such as mulching. It would also, uh, the farmer need to be aware that once the mulching is done, the uh, the, uh, the humus that is created and then uh, the, the uh, water retention by the soil is of a very different order. Even for other crops, let's say if uh, I start with sugar cane and I, create, uh, I cultivate potatoes, the frost that is there, the water would definitely save the crop from uh, frost and everything. So these are multifarious. So this, this is all about spreading awareness, imbibing that water conservation into our cultures and not just for farmers, it is for all of us also. I think... Uh, uh, and it's it's a great uh, nation building initiative that I I, I must compliment uh, uh, the organization here with your great efforts. Thanks. Thank you, Amit. And and I can scale up Amit now for this. So I'm very excited about that as well. Yeah. And you can bring a lot of value in the sugarcane farmer as well as you know we've heard about Asian paints visionary. So you wear that hat as well. Uh, I'm going to go to Dr. Sharath next which is just linked to the same point. But one of the areas you focus on is sustainability of outcomes. So given what you're seeing here, what is your comment on aspects of sustainability and any comment on that? 
Uh, thank you, Joe. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and double thanks to you because you've taken the risk of bringing a Dhanjan in amidst mostly Karamjan. I think I'm the only card carrying Dhanjan perhaps in the room. And that's a bit of a risk there because the Dhanjans, especially the two of the see the Karamjans, then also bring the gurus along with the bad news. Okay. And so I'm going to show them a bit of both. Okay. So first, let me start with the good news. And I think this, of all the three uh, examples that we saw during the day, this one was very explicitly heavily focused on demand side uh, management of water. And I think that is a good news because supply side measures actually don't solve the problem. They move the problem around because in the context of water, water is a different resource from let's say electricity or something. You cannot increase the supply of fresh water except through desalination, which is ridiculously expensive and a certain amount of reuse of wastewater, which is again going to be at a very small level. You cannot create new fresh water. You are moving it around between seasons by creating storage. For example, you make it available for the dry season or you're moving it from surface to ground, ground to surface, upstream to downstream, downstream to upstream, this kind of stuff. So really supply side measures do not solve the problems, whether it is planting trees, and I have a whole set of lectures on why planting trees don't solve your water problems, or even building check dams, because what they're doing is they're recharging groundwater and making it more available to the same guy who is already exploiting that uh, over exploiting groundwater in the first place. So uh, excellent to see demand side measures, uh, excellent to see they're focusing on sugarcane, which is a crop, which is a water guzzling crop. So the gains there are going to be very significant, as you've shown 50% reduction in, in water consumption per acre. That is amazing work. Uh, excellent to see that this is done in collaboration with, with an existing institute like Vasandada Patil Research Institute. And that these improvements in water consumption are also cost effective. The point you made that farmers will not ad adopt it. It needs to be at least cost neutral and uh, preferably cost effective. So I think all this is kudos to you guys. Uh, I would love to see a little bit more data on the labor costs because from the uh, superficially, it is uh, seems to me that you're reducing certain costs, but you're adding to labor because you have to spend labor in the nursery and then again, replanting the, uh, the seed from the nursery to the, uh, to the field. So there might be some increase in labor costs. I'd be curious to see that, but I'll take your word that uh, you have an independent evaluation showing the cost efficiency of the whole thing. Now, some of the bad news. I think the bad news is that there is an absence overall uh, of systemic thinking. Because if you think what is going on here, and here I will also point out the discrepancy between your numbers where you show something that was minus 62% becoming plus or so many percent in terms of the uh, water negative, water positive kind of story. I think we need to be a little bit more careful and rigorous in the way we represent the water balance of a basin. To begin with, a river basin uh, something like Ghod Nadi is part of a larger river basin, Upper Bhima Basin, which turn in turn is part of a larger basin, which is the Bhima Basin, and then in turn large part of the part of the Krishna Basin, which eventually empties into the ocean. So uh, when we are in an Upper Bhima Basin or its subset, which is the Ghod River Basin, we have to which originates in a higher rainfall region, which is the Sahyadris. The first question we should be asking when we are talking about a water balance, not the not just what is the water balance today. But what should be the water balance uh, tomorrow after our intervention? The first question we should be asking is, what is the commitment to the downstream? And the downstream here is Ujini Dam and below from Ujini Dam below and so on and so forth. So I actually in January was in the same basin on a different uh, uh, study tour, which was with those studying the upper Vima basin, which is a slightly bigger area. And we had farmers from the upper reaches and the, and the lower reaches of the basin. And they're saying basically that they, this is one of the most heavily dammed basins in the country in terms of percentage of the uh, basin that has come under damming in terms of the rivers, the tributaries and so on. The one of the most heavily dammed basins. And yet the farmers are complaining downstream that they don't get their full allocation of water. When you uh, look at the upper Bhima basin the, from, uh, from uh, Ujini Dam and go further downstream, they're not getting the water that they're supposed to get. So in general, the question about water and therefore I feel even we are all brought up on the word sustainability, environment equal to sustainability. In the context of water, we must remember that the first and foremost requirement is equity or fairness, fair distribution of water, because water will flow. No matter what you do, rain will fall, water will flow, it will either go more into the ocean, more into Tamil Nadu, or stay more in Karnataka, or within Karnataka, more in the Hemavati, or uh, more with the boring uh, pumping crowd, more with the check dam building crowd. So it is about reallocation of the annual flow. 
and who is using it up through et especially in the agricultural sector the consumption consumptive use of water is evapotranspiration so the question is about fundamentally about fair allocation of water within and across basins i mean because we have artificially drawn a line at uh, chinchwali dam or whatever and we could draw it at uzni dam we could draw it or draw it all the way so we have to ask the question what is the fair allocation downstream and then within the basin and we know for a fact that even within the basin even if you allocate some amount to go to downstream the rest of the water that is used within the basin is highly inequitably used and sugarcane farmers are the biggest consumers at the cost of others with a little addition of uh, uh, unsustainable use of groundwater which is as somebody pre in the previous presentation said that you are actually tap or you yourself said you are tapping into 1000 year old water so that's the unsustainability part of the use but the major problem is unfair use there's an add on of the unsustainability when you come to using up 1000 year old water or 10000 year old water fossil water so having so this is the framework in within which we need to think now in this framework if we ask the question how does improving the water use efficiency of sugarcane help does it address this problem of fair use so who is the deprived are they getting more water that is a question we should ask so the question we should ask is if the downstream was deprived downstream of chinchwali down downstream of ujni are they getting more water because of this effort that's one question or if there is a deprived section within the basin there are the landless there are the uh, rainfed farmers there are the farmers who don't get access to canal irrigation uh, and so on are they getting more water because the sugarcane farmers reduce their use of water right or which is the uh, experience from other contexts where we use water use increase water use efficiency less water use per acre means more acre of sugarcane you look at the evidence from drip irrigation where governments have subsidized drips right left and center whether it is andhra telangana karnataka tamil nadu the major effect of introducing drip is because these are all supply constrained areas water is scarce the moment my uh, uh, water is being used in uh, the amount of water i have is being is available now for 2 acres instead of 1 acre i have 5 acres i can only irrigate 1 acre now with drip i can irrigate 2 acres so the farm level efficiency has gone up the system level efficiency in terms of system level consumption of water has not changed so those are the questions i think we should ask so without taking anything away from the efforts and successful efforts on demand side uh, you know management we should be asking what happens to the water savings that emerge out of this process and i think we'll need to investigate that further as we go along so i'd love to uh, continue the conversation as we go further got it so thank you so i think the third piece that uh, is a piece of collaboration and partnerships right and i think ajit you played an important role as the enabler between the government and the private sector specifically talk a little bit about that because that's come up several times and you are kind of in the middle of making that happen with this program uh can you share a little bit more about how that worked and what we can take away from some of that thanks jo and thank you for the wonderful audience that has been kind of uh, giving excellent questions and also thought provoking uh, comments here um so the genesis of this partnership i think began in karnataka because we started off with a 26000 hectare micro irrigation pilot in northern karnataka where we had a uh, major irrigation companies partner with the government uh, to promote water use efficiency at scale the farm level of course we have a basin level issue as uh, dr lele just pointed out uh but we did actually start with a large scale community micro irrigation program in karnataka that actually led to some great benefits for the farmers and also to the government in terms of water allocation now uh when this project or when this uh, model was kind of um uh, shared with the national government and also with other governments the government of maharashtra decided that they need to have private sector partnerships on farm water level use efficiency initiatives and uh, they wanted to test out a different model and that model was looking at private sector partnerships but from a different perspective of approaching them through an rfp a uh, request for proposals a request for proposals was floated and the government encouraged the private sector to work with civil society and academia to come up with consortia so the entire 3 lakh 50000 hectare of pilots that was kind of initiated back in 2019 uh had six consortia apply for it including itc led consortia as one of the major key players i think uh, a land share of the command area was handled by itc from that uh, river basin itself now we had university of western australia we had iit bombay we had others also 
um, including DSC as partners in most of the consortia. So the consortia really then work with the farmers in creating that uh, interest awareness and also uh, the capacities for institutions to uh, implement programs. So this was the basis for the government to come up with an RFP um, to initiate something that actually helps in PPP uh, design of the program. So the PPP uh, idea here was largely to look at how civil society uh, and the private sector can work together. And it was called as a PPCP approach, which is public private community participation approach. Uh, and this really worked for Maharashtra uh, and that too, I think in the command areas. Now we have a different issue when it comes to dry land areas and command areas. And Dr. Lili just rightly pointed out, if you look at individual farmer based subsidized model for micro irrigation, which really works in the case of dry land areas, it doesn't really work in the case of command areas. So even if you look at the case of Mar um, uh, Gujarat, for example, which is a leader in promotion of micro irrigation, you would see that the penetration or the adoption is higher on the dry land area side. You wouldn't see that much in happening in the command area side because the profile of farmers are different. The challenges of water in the command area and the dry land areas are different. So here you would need to have a different set of institutions working, which also includes the water use associations uh, to work with the government. Uh, and interestingly from Karnataka, what we learned also is that when you don't have these community institutions working full scale, then the transaction cost for the private sector goes up. So even if you discard or kind of discount for all the other exigencies here, if you don't have a well-functioning community institution, the water use associations in this case, or the farmer producer organization in this case, then the PPP models are bound to fail. So that is something that we learned and we tried to correct in the case of uh, Maharashtra by bringing in all sections of or all stakeholders across the board to work together with the government and create this uh, new collective that looked at 350,000 hectares of command area. Thank you. So now I'm going to switch to the audience and uh, Amit ji has got to leave us as well shortly. So if there's any questions, I'm going to take questions and a couple of questions and then I'll get it back to the panelists. So I understand uh, that this would normally be tested out by a third party. Is it not? These authentic? It will be authenticated. All these figures will be authenticated by a third party, right? These are authenticated by VSI for the water safety. Okay. So there's somebody who's authenticating it and giving you a certificate or some influence which says that you know they don't against the certificate is their report. They published a report. Okay, it's so it's farmers' practice, now. They want to give a certificate to ITC. No, no, no. Certificate. I mean authenticating yeah, that indeed yeah. there is a saving. Yeah, yeah. So my question is uh, to doctor, of course, so like sugarcane reduces water consumption is a case for water saving is reducing sugar intake as an action. Also a case for uh, creating a water positive economy and will that get authenticated? We have a question from Niyati Sarin. Uh, she's watching us on YouTube live. Um, can Ajit talk about crop insurance that the water resources group of World Bank worked on? Anything from it, you, given your own interest with this, we've talked about corporates in the room. How can we as corporates come together to create something around sugarcane that will matter to policymakers? Because that's the hat you wear as well, working with the government. Yeah. So that's a question I have for you. But we'll take a couple more questions, Amit, and then you can start and then the others can ask. Any more questions? Yeah, about the price of pesticide and mm -hmm. Have you any study in terms of changes on that? Okay, so we have questions for four people here. So that's a question for you. Let's start with you, Amit, yeah. and then we can go to everyone for their question. Sure, thanks, Joe. Uh, I think uh, very, very interesting discussion and questions uh, here. To uh, coming to your question, Joe, uh, how can corporate collaborate, and what is in in for corporates, and how can they scale up? Perhaps this is where I was coming from. Let's say if we have demonstrated a pilot somewhere in Nanjan Good. And you have brought in the technology, technological intervention. Uh, there is uh, a community uh, participation. We have done our bit. How do we, uh, ITC may have done it for certain crops and in certain areas. How can we scale up? And I think your map showed that very, very clearly. How even if 35 corporates come together, what would be the scale and impact of such interventions? So that is one part. I will also uh, bring in an element here of uh, 
uh, community uh, participation here also in, in in this bit because whatever model that we undertake i think it has to be um, uh, very very dem dem democratized and customized at the village level uh, there so i think i could see that even when we get feedback from people uh, i think um, uh, it is of a different kind of ownership and adapt uh, adoption when we talk to the communities that way let's say if we you have come forward and you have uh, like and it is a partnership not just between corporates it's between the civil society the technology uh, partners and even perhaps the government like because uh, we heard it in the last uh, last panel discussion how various schemes are coming perhaps this intervention should be able to plug the loopholes which are there in the existing schemes and provide that uh, much needed because they may be fragmented i think that was very clearly brought out in the last panel but how do we uh, wound it together how do we become the thread and an enabler and then scale it up to us so that the impact when we talk about or is not just about talking but the impact that is felt is of a very different order and that's a matter of self realization for all of us as a uh, as a as a citizen of the country so it's a nation building exercise in itself even if you go and it has to be both top down and uh, bottoms up somewhere we uh, it is either ways that may not really work because if it is too democratized then the larger picture is lost so somewhere it's a great initiative and uh, i would say uh, compliments to joe and, uh, and and you brought us together here because today i learned many things as to how what itc is doing so perhaps more forums such as this could be created where convergence could be could be visualized established and taken forward because uh, it's very important to talk about okay you have demonstrated a model uh, maybe a customized format how do we scale it up and uh, it was very impressive to see how you have done it at a national level perhaps a little bit of customization in what if we are let's say talking about indo gangetic plain where there is a alluvial uh, soil it may be requiring a different kind of uh, intervention or a customization here maybe it's a uh, uh, in in the laterites it could require a very different uh, kind of intervention and the cropping pattern would be different the water conservation strategy could be different let's say in northern india uh, the water uh, uh, availability is not much of an issue it's about uh, more often the contamination of water let's say we are talk somebody talked about punjab so much of water has gone into those alluvial soils that the water table the the aquifer waters is now uh, really not of good quality uh so how do we prevent that the qualitative aspect of it so when we look at it holistically so the point i'm trying to make is how do we holistically look at uh, our livelihoods and their connections with water and then uh, have a strategy maybe like minded corporates enabled by people such as you or your or your organization could create a cumulative strategy uh, implementation plan and really the outcomes can really be of a very different order rather than we working in our separate domains and maybe there could be a very good case to even talk to the government together let's say if there is a jal jeevan mission what can all how we all can contribute to that perhaps it would be a very different order of a, a project implementation that can be spoken about so uh, maybe uh, that these were some thoughts which i had thank you thanks sure i think on uh, the the design of the insurance program is what yeah what we yeah. had asked for just um so i think the innovation that we are trying out and again this is just a work in progress um is about linking the carbon credit market with the insurance market um and there's a lot that needs to be kind of standardized uh, in both the fronts so what we are trying to do is that this is not a lot of money that we are talking about the carbon credit market at least from the experience that we have in uttar pradesh and in maharashtra is uh, fetching a farmer roughly around the range of 2000 rupees or so per hectare and that to after several levels of validation and processes to be met so what we are trying to do is that if you are talking about risk bearing ability of the farmer and also 
we are also looking at the agriculture income of farmers the problem has been that most of the startups or the models has been vying for the very minimal income that the farmer gets and been kind of promoting a subscription based model so what we are trying to do here is a bit different by bringing in the carbon credit market to pay for the credit pay for the insurance premium up front so that the farmers risk taking ability to move to a sustainable practice increases otherwise even if you take the case of sugarcane or for that matter rice for example if you want to move for the move the farmer from flooded rice to direct seeded rice or alternative wetting and drying there's a certain level of penalty that the farmer has to go through at some stage and to get the farmer across to the sustainability regime you would need to have a different set of insurance products that might be linked to germination that might be linked to crop failures to large extent and that kind of products would need to be linked to the sustainability benefits that the farmer can accrue over a period of time so this is an experiment in in the cards we are actually working with a couple of micro irrigation sorry uh, insurance companies and carbon credit markets out here uh but what we face as a challenge in designing and also implementing the program is one in terms of data the data has not been of that great granularity that you can actually share it with the private sector for the financial sector so that's been a challenge at the same time um the carbon credit market also itself is evolving so we need to look and see how we need to kind of grapple that with and the last point is also that there are three shared challenges that's faced by the market the government and the farmer which is one is the lack of accountability transparency and a proper price discovery mechanism so when you actually kind of deal with these three challenges then the farmer is better able to kind of believe in the system and work with uh, the insurance and the financial sector so that's a work in progress we are trying to do this in up and also in maharashtra um and initially we see some gains in terms of water reuse in agriculture um so we are trying to also promote water reuse in agriculture by bringing in the carbon credit market to benefit the farmer and this is small scale farmers that we are talking about as a person who consumes a lot of sugar himself sweet tooth lele is what i am called um i have a hard time giving up mithai and all those things and it shows on my body as well so yes i think giving up sugar reducing your sugar consumption will uh, indirectly also influence the water issue much more than sugar perhaps rice because if you switch from rice to millets it's going to have a dramatic impact and the amount of rice we consume in our daily lives is much more than the amount of sugar we consume so in that sense the switching from rice to millets is actually a much bigger contribution to the problem but i think to look at again systemically so why do we why do we get hooked on to sugar number 1 and what is the role of system in getting them hooked on to sugar it's not just that parents teach children to eat mithai and love mithai and all that look at the amount of advertising on Uh, uh you know all media in terms of uh, chocolates and all this kind of stuff that goes on look at the amount of government support to the sugar sugar cane industry i'm not saying sugar cane farmer but sugar cane industry and the political economy of sugar factories today which is that the sugar factories are controlled by a certain political elite and they will not allow you to reduce the area under sugar cane and allow you to go you know uh, uh, defraud them of uh, incredible profits so there is a much larger system at at play here and this brings me to the role of government which i think only anuj mentioned so far in the entire day's discussion which is i think we cannot ignore the role of government as not just as a provider of public goods such as knowledge or you know information supporting research and so on and so forth but more importantly bringing a certain regulatory aspect into the picture whether it is about how what savings get shared so public money gets invested for example in this is an old story public money gets invested in watershed programs water is actually infiltrated and then it is privatized through ground water because only those who have wells and access to those wells uh, get to tap into that additional infiltration that happened so this is an old story of public goods becoming private goods or common pool resources becoming private resources and the government has failed repeatedly in playing its role as a regulator for example saying that if we invest in uh, a scheme which which saves water then we will have a say in how that saved water will get distributed who will have first charge on the saved water who will have first charge when a uh, tank is desilted and perhaps more storage is created who is actually going to get that additional water that is being created from public uh, you know public funds now the government is just absconded from this sector i mean 20 years ago we had a whole gs wise program in karnataka jal samardhana yojana which was well bank funded so indirectly tax payer money going to eventually repay those loans and uh, there is no learning that we should be taking with ourselves saying did that program succeed how much why it failed 
And therefore, are we just repeating those failure uh, stories that five years down the road, the same times will be silted again? I think we need to also learn. That's also the role of uh, the Dhyanchans, which is to, you know, if, if the Karamchans want to talk to them, then we can provide the information on, on what are those learnings from the same story being repeated over the last 30, 40 years. And what is the role that of government? Government is captive to a lot of sugarcane farmer lobbies, sugarcane factory lobbies, other industry which is dependent on sugar. So the sugar, as an example, where it is an individual consumption decision at the end, I agree. And we all think that, oh, I'll drive less, I'll eat less sugar, I'll, I'll switch from rice to millet, I'm being sustainable. Yes. But if you want to make a dent in the problem, we have to work collectively to get the government to pass or implement better policies on these, which is going to be a tough fight, but I think you need to take it up. Thank you. On a lighter note, what you have said, uh, in one of the internal presentations, uh, we were uh, presenting to our management on the sugarcane thing. Yeah, that is, that crop has no future. Why are you working on that? So one of our senior managers said, then we said, but ITC itself also produced so much. So do we mean to say, <laughs> means if it, not that it is linked to our supply chain that time, the Pune sugar, but problem is that means there is also that view like sugar can, sugar may not have future. Uh, because of the diabetics and all. So it is on a lighter note. I have no view taken on that. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I'll start with uh, what Dr. Lele himself had. I felt I was in a Viva OC after so many years. Actually, the, they, were, they are valid points. There is no doubt. Only few which I can answer. Uh, one is the downstream to be taken care of uh, was uh, the point. So at least I feel the data which uh, Joe shared. There was like the, uh, the control where we didn't work. There, the improvement was 7%, whereas downstream improvement was 9%, which means even if they improved 7%, there was an additional improvement we had added to the downstream. That's what the data said, one good thing. But even if there was no such data, the point is I didn't take away what was going. I only reduced what I am using. So definitely it should flow into that is at least technically, I think so. Uh, but that's a point taken. And when the water balance estimate was done, uh, it had two things. One is the water that comes from external basin into gourd and also what are gourd's commitments downstream because below Chinchini Dam, there are the uh, commitments. Chinchini Dam has to release so much. So that was also taken in water balance and broken into season. That's when the post monsoon deficit also came. The other point was the futuristic by water balance. It's a really, very valid point in the study. We have 2030 future projection. Uh, which was uh, some 10 million cubic meter or something uh, adding to the deficit. But uh, recently we also discussed we should revisit it uh, even on the 2030 and also have a 2050 projection also and see if it is really going to be sustainable. And I agree it is not total Krishna basin, it is only God basin. God is Bhima, Bhima is Krishna. I hope we will get into that scale and uh, really means along with all partners. Only thing you said, uh, some artificial uh, delineation, it is not artificial delineation, uh, that is in watershed terms, that is where Chinchini Dam, after that it just joins Bhima. That's where we have cut the uh, basin. Uh, these were few of the questions. Inside the water, the saved, how to actually equitable distribution, it's a point and uh, you'll see like we are not the custodians of that, but it's a point, I agree. On, uh, luckily, coincidence, whatever, sugarcane, there is a limit on the sugar that mills take. So even if, because it's becoming very pro profitable, there is not great chance that farmers will actually add to the area. There is a range of five to 6,000 acre hectares, which goes between sugarcane and onion based on the pricing. Otherwise, they can't increase because the sugar mills set up the limit of procurement. And uh, then the question a fertilizer and uh, pesticide. So uh, the fertilizer thing is taken care of in this whole thing because of the mulching. There is a saving on the fertilizer requirement and it also has gone into the income calculation that was done. I mean, the cost came down because I remember some 10% or so fertilizer has reduced. Uh, pesticide per se, sugarcane is not a very big, uh, serious pesticide consumer as compared to cotton, chili and even paddy crop to certain extent and all. Uh, we didn't do a very dedicated program on pesticide because what was going on was there. But we do have in our hub villages with uh, farmer field school, uh, wherever we work in the farmer field school, each school, all these decoctions of neem and uh, the other one, uh, Vitex Negundo, these decoctions we did promote. But I will not say it got scaled up because it was not a very big thrust area. 
Thank you. Okay, we're going to do one final round. We need to wrap up for the evening. If you can, I can just see the show of hands. We have a question there. We have a question there. Okay. So question to Professor Lele in the context of equity being the thing that one should worry about when you think about water fast. Especially the comments made in the morning, the survey comments from Pridula were about saying people don't care about politics around water or voting around water, right? And whatever you have heard through the day, uh, what do you see as the role of collectivization there? Because we talk about water user associations, we talk about VWSCs in JJM, Pani Samiti. But I mean, with your experience, what are you seeing as a trend? Is the scarcity going to strengthen that? Is this anyway getting atomized? Is technology further atomizing it? Any thoughts? In the sugarcane fields, if we do mulching on the sugarcane trash, so it will take more carbon to decompose. Like it will not give the nutrients to the plant. So it is a first 45 days, it gives negative impact. So only moisture can be saved. That is what my experience is. Not exactly a question, but a, a view. Uh, thanks to Dr. Lele, who brought in an element of balance in the way we look at projects. Generally, conferences talks about how things went well, what's the pink side of the story. But what you brought in was an element to see that, okay, when you do things, there's always two sides of the coin, what works well and what inadvertently a corporate or government or civil society does, but there are ramifications of those actions and which you very nicely narrated through that downstream kind of an exercise that somebody's gain led to somebody's loss. So uh, subsequently, I will request to connect with you where I would like you to review our water projects and virtually thrash us where we went wrong, where we can improve. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So if you all can respond, I think uh, one to you, Vijay, on the sugarcane, the mulching part, and if you can talk a little bit about... So uh, I won't talk about thrashing. But the collectivization. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Anuj, I think your question is a really challenging one. So uh, there's a several layers or several things that are going on here. One is I think that we have shaped the discourse around environmental problems in general and water in particular using only this, this catchy term called sustainability. And I'm one of the early uh, proponents as well as commentators, as well as reviewers of this idea of sustainable development and sustainability from my pre-PhD days. And I've noticed that we tend to reduce environmental thinking to sustainability thinking. And it's very comfortable and catchy because we are saying we are doing it, what is sustainability over time? So for our future generations. And so it's sort of very convenient to say our, you know, for future generations, what we mean is our future generations. So we are not, we are saying keep the distribution of income slash poverty in the country the same. Just make sure that, that, you know, it's continued over time. So the rich stay rich, the poor stay poor, that's sustainability, right? By definition. So, uh, whereas the environmental question is deeply entangled with questions of fairness. I will try not to use the word equity because it has a certain bad rap in especially corporate circles. Uh, just think about the idea of fairness. If you are upstream and somebody is downstream of you, water flows downstream. If you pollute the river, that person has to drink dirty water. If you abstract from the river, that person gets less water. So environmental issues and water in particular, because it flows from upstream to downstream, is fundamentally entangled with the question of fairness on the pollution side, on the resource allocation side also. But we want to talk about water sustainability. And I think we need to change that discourse, number one. Number two, when we talk about uh, uh, sharing of water, the efficiency question, of course, remains because in a sense, if you say we want to allocate X to the sugarcane farmers and Y to the uh, rain-fed farmers and Z to the city or the uh, industry, uh, obviously, their need, quote-unquote, is influenced by how efficient they are. That is, that is a given. So, in that sense, it does not prevent us from working on the efficiency question. But in the absence of a sharing framework, as I said, the person who was using X continues to use X for double the acreage. So if the issue really was about people who don't have access to water at all downstream or in the same basin and so on. So I feel that this part of the discourse is missing and collectivization is again has a bad connotation. We use water users associations only for efficiency purposes when fundamentally it was about fair allocation in the dam from the head reach to the tail reach. And, but the government doesn't want to strengthen their voice on that front. 
इट ओनली वॉन्ट्स टू यूज दम एज अ वे टू रिकवर वॉटर चार्जेस यू नो इरीगेशन का जो पैसा लेते हैं दैट इज नॉट बींग रिकवर्ड सो गेट दब्ल्यू यू एस एंड इफ यू रिमेम्बर दर्सन हू टॉक अबाउट डब्ल्यू यू ए फर्स्ट थिंग दे सेट वॉज कि वी इम्प्रूव वॉटर चार्ज रिकवरी बट वी ऑल्सो डिड अ कपल ऑफ एडिशनल थिंग्स सो करेक्ट दैट इज द प्रायोरिटी दैट हाउ वी हैव कोच द डब्ल्यू यू एस ऑल्सो टू थिंग्स सो आई थिंक we can work on this issue at multiple levels uh, what is the need for uh, what are, you know what is the role of even industry associations it struck me in the morning when we were looking at the example of asian paints in gundalpet uh, 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 nanjanwad area sorry nanjanwad is known to be one of the most polluted uh, regions in india it's a pollution hotspot in in the state so um, it is also useful for the asian paints to actually do collectivization with the rest of the industry and reduce the polluting emit effluents that are coming out of the industrial areas that might be much more socially beneficial as compared to investing in just the water question because i said there there are many other uh, factors also at play the supply side story doesn't really quite quite pan out and yeah, i can talk to people separately about why that is the case but i just thought it's a very incomplete answer perhaps to your question but Point Anuj, I think uh, see when we look at this question around collectivization, and this is something that we always try to optimize for, right? Like we need to have better collective institutions that be- that do better governance and also implementation here. Now the problem is when you look at the investment side, you see that a bulk of investments is going for private irrigation, and you see a lot of kind of more of private irrigation wells and also bore wells coming up. so when you look at states that have kind of you're looking at state like up for example 40 lakh tube wells and you don't have one single water use association which can be said to be a template for a role model for a state that draws the maximum amount of groundwater globally right so you're looking at individual uh, kind of models which would need to and again the government is trying its best to kind of come up with community irrigation models and this is a state which has got the maximum common area share and you don't still have a model that can actually bring in collectivization so by nature investment also is driving the type of institutions that we have on the ground yeah uh, so the point was uh, trash mulching doesn't improve carbon only moisture retention so my point is that uh, it's not my practice first thing i'm just talking technically so um, it is against oh, the baseline practice the baseline is burning you burn you lose everything so now it is about uh, when you actually apply as a carpet or whatever apply back to soil there will definitely be carbon losses in the normal uh, decomposition because it's on the surface so i am comparing with the baseline of burning practice mm-hmm. if it is generally looked at like when the uh, trash is spread out so there will be some carbon loss yes it will be but against burning definitely there will be carbon which is getting added back to soil that's a very straight technical recommendation is what i feel okay 